So, good morning. My name is Christopher Kutz. I'm a consultant project manager at LBST, Ludwig Bölkus' Team Technik. And in the high series project, we were responsible for the energy system modeling. And I'm really happy to present some of the results to you today. I must admit that uh, most of the, of the work in this work package was not done by myself, but, my, but my, uh, from my former colleague Jan Michalski. He's uh, not longer part of the LBST, but still I'm doing my very best to present the uh, main results to you and also uh, lay out the uh, key learnings we had from this energy system modeling. In, um, yeah, in the introduction today and already yesterday, we saw that um, the porous media storage is uh, a quite important um, way to store hydrogen or could be a quite important way in the future. Um, but still, there are some um, key uh, limitations. And um, what we now wanted to do is to understand how the European energy system actually um, will look like in the future. We tried to model that and how the, um, what role um, and, and essentially what numbers there are for the demand of hydrogen storage. So what I want to do is give you a brief background and, uh, and an approach on what we were doing here and then dive into the results, have some general results on the hydrogen uh, technologies and how they were used in the, uh, will be used in the future energy system. And then in the, in the fourth part, actually focus on the underground hydrogen storage solutions. So with this, what was actually the, uh, our aim of this uh, whole modeling result? We really wanted to understand um, how the future energy system could look like. Um, therefore, we modeled the uh, energy system on the European level, also taking the different countries uh, into account. And in the end, the, the aim was to understand which numbers are there to, to get a feeling how much energy storage is really needed in the future. Um, to, to estimate that, we used our in-house model, the, the uh, so-called lens model, and um, uh, analyzed different scenarios. Um, I, I will describe the scenarios in more detail in a moment, but we have this different timeline, 2030, 2040, 2050, and um, with that, we, we hope to give you an indication on how this uh, storage demand will develop. Some of the key technical uh, parameters we will discuss are already listed here today uh, on, the, on the slide, you see it over here. So the uh, storage volume capacity, the, the throughput, the storage, and then also the uh, injection withdrawal capacities we need on the European level, we have the full cycle equivalence. So actually uh, the throughput and ratio to the, to the overall volume. And then we have the, um, uh, we, we kind of looked also at the infrastructure, how to bring the energy flows uh, from one country to the others and what effect that also has on the storage um, need. Uh, the whole documentation, the whole results are all av available at the High Stories website, so I invite you to have a look. Um, work package 5 results. And um, yeah, when now looking at the um, approach, you see we have actually the supply side, the energy conversion, storage transport side, and then the demand side. And what you see in green is the uh, power system. The power grid we modeled with uh, uh, renewable and uh, dispatchable power plants um, with diff different storage technologies, also demand side management, curtailment. And then we have in blue the whole hydrogen grid with the electrolyzers and the hydrogen turbine as a key sector coupling technologies. And then we have a really in this model, we, we lay the focus on the different storage technologies. We have here the salt caverns storage uh, in, in depleted oil, uh, gas and oil fields and then saline aquifers, and then also other hydrogen technologies, which to be honest, mainly are above storage tube storages. Um, and so what we actually did not look so much into is the, the line rocked 
um, storage technique, um, but still um, we, we'll see they are kind of covered in this other hydrogen technologies. And then of course we have three main uh, end use sectors, it's industry, it's mobility and uh, residential. And with that, we um, yeah, had, a, had a picture of the whole energy, energy system in the future. And um, the approach now was actually a three step approach. So in the first step, we took the um, long term investment decisions in the different capacities so uh, power plant capacities, pipeline capacities, and also the uh, storage capacities. And the second step, it was about the scheduling. So when and op operating of all these units. So when, which power plant should produce. And then the third step was really um, to, to look at the grid again, uh, where are additional capacities needed uh, between those grid nodes, so between the different countries. and. Um, with this whole model, we had then the, the economic optimization of what is the best solution, the, the cost minimal solution for the whole European energy system. There were several input parameters. So let's say some general boundary condition. This mainly covers um, like the general uh, CO2 cap and also uh, fuel prices. We have techno-economic data, which were also discussed with the advisory board uh, for the for the uh, storage uh, technologies, and so these are very important uh, input data, which which mainly um, affect the results of the model uh, quite heavily. Then we have country specific data on the power demand, on the hydrogen demand, um, the existing topology of the power and, and gas grid in Europe, and finally um, demand data, time dependent profiles for the different demand sectors in, in different uh, countries. So um, probably all of you know that uh, energy system models, of course, have also their limitations. Uh, you cannot just take some numbers without seeing the whole context and without looking at the assumptions. Uh, and therefore, it's always important to have different scenarios to really uh, analyze the impact when you change certain uh, key parameters. And what we have chosen here in, in this project are basically four uh, scenarios. Scenario one and B, uh, A and B, they um, focus mainly on domestic hydrogen production within Europe. So we have a less uh, important role for, for imports, which on the other side will be a main source of hydrogen uh, supply in scenario C and D. And then looking at the uh, storage technologies, the main differentiation between this uh, to uh, all these four uh, scenarios are that in scenario A and C we have focused only on salt caverns. So that was the only underground storage technologies available. Uh, while in uh, scenarios B and D, salt caverns and porous media um, were uh, modeled. And you will see that this basically has a quite tremendous uh, impact on the distribution of storage sites within Europe and also on the um, infrastructure needed. With that, I'm happy to now give you some of the, uh, the more general results. So the um, first part is about the hydrogen supply. And uh, very generally what you see is when we, when we look at the, uh, today's hydrogen supply, we're, and since we are doing the energy system modeling, I'm, I'm sorry, but now we are using the terawatt hour as, as unit, but uh, still we come to the uh, megatons, uh, standard cubic meters, which uh, most of you, the engineers probably use, are more familiar with. We will come to that in a moment and also set that uh, into, into um, perspective. But still today, uh, the um, hydrogen demand in Europe is about 260 uh, terawatt hours. And um, what you see, the assumption in this model is that it's significantly increased until 2050 when we really uh, want to have this um, uh, renewable-based energy system with uh, zero emissions. And um, what, what you see in dark green is that the green uh, or the renewable hydrogen production via electrolysis 
will be the main uh, or is assumed to be the main uh, supply path. Um, uh, steam methane reforming with CCS is only uh, a minor contributor within the um, transition period. And then we have uh, import, uh, that's a light a blue and light green part, um, which is basically in 2030, in this scenario A and B, very small. And then scenario C and D, we see that we have this uh, around 50%. And now um, to set that into perspective, we look at uh, Yorgo from uh, Hydrogen Europe already yesterday uh, announced or, or uh, explained this new ambition of the European Commission from the Repower EU package. So we have not only the 10 megatons, 333 terawatt hours, which were um, two years ago the, the goal, but the ambition increased and now we have for 2030 already 666 uh, terawatt hours or 2 plus uh, 10 plus 10 megatons uh, renewable hydrogen in Europe 2030. And you see that these ambitions are even higher than what we assumed here for 2030. Although of course in the long term they will, they will um, come together again. Uh, so um, that needs to be kept in mind when looking at the, the final numbers. What does uh, our results mean for the uh, need of electrolyzer capacity in Europe? So you see um, capacity of 70 to 150 gigawatt would be required already in 2030. So even higher numbers that um, the European Commission has in their 40 gigawatt plan for 2030. Um, but of course, this whole energy system model here really has a focus on, on green hydrogen and uh, is quite ambition in this respect. Long term, we see that even 350 to 500 gigawatts are needed in the different scenarios for domestic production within Europe. And then on top of that, there's uh, again uh, in uh, import capacity needed of um, up to 27 gigawatt in those scenarios with less import capacity and uh, up to 19 gigawatt in those scenarios with a higher import share. Um, what is quite interesting is that the utilization rate in our model uh, is very high also after 2025. So we see here 3,000 to 4,000 um, hours per year where the electrolyzers are needed. This is an uh, uh, indication of the importance of electrolyzer technology for the whole energy system. But of course, uh, looking at the regulation we currently see, um, it is also challenging to really have those high numbers when, um, when looking at the uh, RFNBO Delegated Act, when there are so many um, conditions for hydrogen, um, which hydrogen is being used. Jorge has uh, pointed that out already yesterday. So, basically said when, when these conditions really apply, then we will need even more um, uh, electrolyzer capacity. So very briefly to, to um, give you the whole picture, also here the, the power supply. And um, when we look at the role hydrogen can play here, we see uh, basically two roles, uh, re-electrification and um, what it is, um, Basically, it only appears in 2050. There's a need of hydrogen re-electrification and compared to the overall power supply of here, nearly 6,000 terawatt hours, it's really small. It's about 150 to 300 uh, terawatt hours by 2050. But when we only look at the uh, dispatchable power plants, and here, this is what you see on the right side. So. Um, today and in 2030, we have still a lot of coal. We have uh, natural gas, we even have oil for the um, dispatchable power plant market. And then until 2050, we see that all this fossil-based power um, will need to be phased out. And then suddenly hydrogen kicks in and we need a lot of capacity in Europe, 190 to 230 gigawatt uh, capacity of re-electrification uh, by turbines, by fuel cells. So um, this is actually a quite big amount and still 
uh, it is strongly connected to the to the uh, hydrogen storage capacity we need since um, this is basically when we need hydrogen and um, this is in um, often in, in peak hours when there's not necessarily the renewable electricity production from uh, wind or solar. And now um, for the next minutes, I'm happy to, to um, be more precise on what that means for the hydrogen storage in Europe. Um, we, we already saw this figure yesterday when we were talking about the uh, actual capacities and potential, theoretical potential, uh, which is there within Europe. And what you see here is um, the different uh, technologies, so salt cavern, pers media, and other hydrogen storages for the different scenarios over the different uh, time horizons. And what you see is that already in 2030, there is a substantial need for um, hydrogen storage in underground um, reservoirs and salt caverns and looking at scenario B and D. So these were basically these scenarios where both technologies were um, feasible that it will kind of start with the salt caverns. Porous media will slowly kick in, but uh, in 2030 it's with 20 to 40 terawatt hours all in all already a quite huge amount. This will, however, increase significantly and until 2050, where we then have uh, 280 to 320 terawatt hours uh, of um, uh, demand. So about 100 billion cubic meters storage capacity is needed. Um, this is this whole amount compared to the to the demand for hydrogen is actually as similar to, similar to what we see for natural gas today. And um, yeah, looking at the scenarios without porous media and those with porous media, we see that the um, that yeah about fifty percent of the actual um, hydrogen storage demand will need to be covered by porous media and in case Perus media are not there, it's just not feasible to use it, everything would need to be done with uh, salt caverns. And here we might have a problem with the uh, existing capacities uh, in salt caverns, and, and therefore it's so important to also look into these uh, other technologies. What does it mean for the injection and withdrawal capacity? So um, what you see, is that the in until 2050 the injection capacity will increase until uh, uh, up to 300 gigawatt and but in contrast to that the withdrawal capacity that will be needed is even higher um, up to 500 gigawatt so the the reason for this difference is as i pointed out before already the the need for re-electrification we need those um, hydrogen underground storage for to to um, bring energy into the uh, also the power system, uh, especially in those peak hours when renewable uh, electricity generation is not present. And then you see that the uh, injection and withdrawal capacities for cell covens are due to their flexibility, of course, even even higher compared to Perse Media, although the volume capacity, as said before, uh, is about the same uh, when we look at scenario B and scenario D. We also have done the, the modeling on the country level. Um, however, and, and that must be said, there are of course some limitations. Each country is uh, modeled as one single node, so one virtual hub, if you want. And um, so the all the um, pipeline and power sector restriction constraints within these, each country cannot be um, taken into account here. But what we see is that the um, hydrogen storage capacities will focus on certain key um, uh, countries, certain key um, hubs for hydrogen where, where there's a lot of demand or a lot of production. So we see here um, 
Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Poland, and in addition, uh, also the UK is quite important in this in this um, whole uh, hydrogen underground storage market. And uh, what we see is that the technology choice in each country highly differs uh, from each other in this uh, cost optimal solution. And um, while in most countries there is a potential for salt caverns and for porous media, um, Italy is really an interesting and special case because in, in uh, Italy there were uh, no uh, salt caverns uh, um, assumed at all as there are no salt caverns there today. Um, but still, these huge amounts uh, you see here, um, oh, let's start it in another way. When you, when you look at the countries, you really need to take into account that there are very complex interdependencies between the different, between uh, the countries when you look at the distribution of power, uh, hydrogen, of, of hydrogen underground storage. And so when, for example, and that is what uh, Jan already explained yesterday, when you, for example, take um, technical constraints for porous media into account for Italy, then the whole um, storage, uh, porous media storage uh, volumes for Italy will decrease significantly. Uh, so we will be above, uh, about at the half of this value here. But what will happen then? In the European energy system, of course, you still need those porous media storages, especially for the, for the seasonal storage, as we see in a moment. And therefore, this storage capacity will move or will be shifted to France. And France then has high um, additional porous media capacity, uh, but then as a consequence, the salt current capacity in France will be reduced. And so this uh, salt current capacity is still needed in the overall energy system. Um, and so it will be shifted to other countries like Germany, like the Netherlands, like the UK, which are interconnected by the, by the hydrogen pipelines. And so in the end, for the European level, it, the demand for, um, uh, for uh, salt caverns, for, high, for porous media storage, will really be rather constant, taking different assumptions into account, but we will see this reallocation between the different countries. Uh, what we also have done is looking at the operational cycle of those um, underground storages. We'll uh, see that Purs Media really has a one seasonal cycle, um, cycle equivalence of about one. So that is really, it's being, actually it's being filled throughout the summer months and then it's being emptied. Um, but at the other side, we see that there's also in a salt cavern, so that's a green line here, there's also a seasonality, but it also offers a lot of um, short-term buffer. So really daily um, injection withdrawal to, to take this value of, of, of uh, the underground storage also for the short-term into account. And um, so uh, for this example, it's uh, for France, we see 1.3, 1.5 cycles per year. Uh, the average in the European Union is even higher. So about two cycles per year for this uh, salt caverns. And here you really see this um, additional short-term flexibility the storage can provide. Um, very briefly, um, this comparison again, salt caverns on the one side and porous media storages, which were only part of some scenarios on the other side. And I think what is important here is that when there's no porous media, we really need quite a lot of, we would need quite a lot of salt caverns. And it's really a um, matter of technical potential, whether that is really suitable. Um, what is interesting is that a huge part of the overall throughput is going um, through the salt caverns. And that is of course also important for the, for the business case in the end, but it's just because of the, the different uh, amount of cycles you have. You have a lot, um, up to two cycles per salt cavern and only one cycle for, for the um, purse media storage. And therefore, of course, different business cases apply in, in both cases. And uh, now for the last point, uh, the geographical distribution. I'd actually like to show you the 
just the maps. So you see um, here um, the scenario B and scenario D. So the uh, scenarios where both storage technologies were applied. And um, in, in uh, these bubbles, they kind of represent the size of the underground storage need and uh, demand. And then in black, you have the infrastructure, the um, exchange between the countries that were required. And so in 2030, 2040, 2050, you see that the infrastructure between the countries will develop. And uh, in line with the infrastructure, also the, the size of the hydrogen storage will increase. You see the different yeah, big hubs like Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Poland, uh, UK. I, I explained that before. But still, um, when you now compare the Salt Cavern and Porous Media case in this picture with the Salt Cavern only case, so where we say there are no porous media possible in certain countries, um, then we have really a geographical uh, yeah, a focus, a centralized um, storage, me uh, storage uh, hydrogen underground storage, and which requires additional capacity between the countries, so infrastructure capacity, but at the same time require additional and further cur uh, curtailment of renewable power. So actually two um, economic um, advantages of PERS media, which they can bring in into the system, higher regional distribution, uh, and so less need for infrastructure um, and uh, curtailment. And with that, I'd like to uh, close my presentation. So uh, I hope I could show you at least the pivotal role we see for the hydrogen technologies in, um, in our energy system model, uh, especially also in the short term already, until 2030. Um, there is, for both technologies, a strong seasonal pattern, um, which of course is driven by the assumption uh, which we have discussed with the advisory board members. And um, yeah, the application of porous media has those advantages, which to enable a really broad uh, geographical distribution of storage facilities across Europe, and um, therefore some economic advantages with regard to containment and infrastructure needs. With that, thank you very much um, also to the partners. And um, I really like to, for, for uh, any detailed question, I already want to refer you to the documentation. Um, and otherwise, I'm really happy to answer your questions now. Thank you. So thank you, Christopher. We have time for one question. None. Oh, yes, Serge. Thank you very much for this uh, great presentation and all the great work. Um, I was thinking about the factor time and especially lead times. Uh, did your model consider the lead time for development? Because we need these, this is really steep ramp up of uh, capacity development. And yeah, as we see it now, pilots and some demonstration projects will exist by 2030 but then it has to ramp up and then scale up. Did your model consider also those uh, aspects? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. That's actually the, the most important point we, we would like to point out. Um, no, actually no lead times were considered because that is what we really wanted to show what is needed. And now, and uh, I hope we will have this discussion also um, uh, this afternoon in the panel. Now we really need to, to really kick it off, we need to start right now actually, because there are these large lead times of several years, up to 10 to 15 years, we heard that yesterday. And uh, 2030 is only seven years away. And still we need a lot of capacity. And that's the reason why we really should um, need more pilots and then really scale it up. Thank you. Thank you. So